Welcome, Minchi Li. It's a pleasure to have you here in Vienna. Minchi Li is uh, in Vienna on the invitation of the VIDC, the Vienna Institute uh, for International Dialogue and Cooperation, um, that gives us the chance to have a talk on China and China in the world and your view on capitalism. Um, Minchi Li is professor of economics at the University of Utah and uh, a critical political economist. Um, I would say in the tradition of world systems perspective. Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. So um, Minchi, um, my first question, question goes to the, um, the development model or growth model of China. How would you characterize the development model. We hear a lot about upgrading and environmental regulations um, which are set in force. Um, how would you characterize it? Is China still the sweatshop of the world relying on cheap labor exports and nothing else? Okay, thank you. Uh, and then uh, thank you for your invitation. And it's great pleasure to be in the great city of Vienna uh, to join the colleagues of VIDC to discuss uh, very interesting issues. Uh, regarding your question about uh, China's growth model, and uh, so the answer is both yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that uh, hundreds of millions of workers uh, in China continue to suffer from sweatshop conditions and then the uh, environmental degradation and uh, it's still very serious. And you could even say that many of the ecological system in China uh, are now on the verge of collapse. So in that regard, uh, China's growth is still based on the exploitation of cheap labor as well as uh, the damage to the environment. Now, on the other hand, because of China's growth has transformed China's social structure, and so people have become more conscious of their rights in terms of labor and the social errors as well as, as the environment. So there has been growing resistance uh, from the workers uh, from uh, local people against environmental damage. So for that reason, uh, on the one hand, uh, the Chinese labor is not as cheap as they used to be, uh, even though the workers are still being uh, intensely exploited. Uh, then, uh, moreover, uh, because of this uh, resistance against uh, environmental damage, uh, that uh, has put some pressure on the Chinese government uh, to impose certain regulations. And uh, China act actually has also uh, accomplished some limited success uh, in certain areas, uh, like uh, in the area of air pollution. You could say that uh, uh, for air pollution around Beijing, uh, the capital city, uh, it has uh, improved somewhat compared to the worst condition a few years ago. So would you say? Sorry. <laughs> Would you say that there is a labor movement on the way, which is quite obvious, I suppose, there is um, much written about that. But would you say that there exists also an, an, an environmental movement nowadays in China, or are they even the same? Uh, well, certainly there is environmental movement, and that is taking place in big cities, that is also taking place in many rural areas uh, against the uh, uh, pollution of, say, chemical factories, uh, against the building of uh, polluting power plants, uh, or uh, other issues related to the health of uh, local people. Uh, so this kind of environmental movement and labor movement uh, are taking place. Now it's hard to say whether these two are the same thing, but certainly they interact, uh, overlap uh, with each other. And so uh, this kind of growing demand, and I think will uh, become a growing pressure on China's current regime of capitalist accumulation. Uh, so potentially uh, it could uh, impose limits on China's capitalist profit. So if that kind of contradiction cannot be resolved, uh, China's current growth model may not be sustained in the future. Um, and what about upgrading um, from made in China to designed in China to created in China? How do you evaluate these efforts? 
Well, every capitalist uh, economy is attempts to have this so-called upgrade. Uh, in other words, trying to produce uh, more value-added goods uh, in the global market. Uh, so Chinese capitalism is not an exception. Uh, so in this regard, uh, you could say the Chinese economy uh, has been more successful uh, than many of the other low-income or middle-income countries. And so China now produce a broad range of output uh, in the global market. Uh, but that has been said, uh, in terms of the most highly value-added goods, China continue to depend on the supply from US, Japan, from uh, Western Europe. Uh, so uh, China uh, is not yet in the position uh, to have a claim on the monopolistic profit in the global market. And so even if that is happening, that uh, you still raises the question about and whether China can do that to a very large degree, and therefore China could have monopolistic profit not only in individual areas, but also, say, uh, uh, for the uh, a big fraction of the global economy, uh, in order to solve China's internal contradictions. But in the unlikely scenario, China will succeed in this objective. That would raise serious question. If China is going to take over all the high value added market in the world, and what space is left for Europe, for North America? Okay, yeah, that's a crucial question. But before coming back to, to this issue, I would like to ask you if China is able to energize the world economy. So growth has slowed down, the growth machine has lost uh, its luster, so to say. But what would you say, is China still in the position to boost the world economy? Okay, regarding that question, officially, the Chinese economy is still growing at close to 7%. And then if we talk about the contribution of the Chinese income growth to the global income growth, and regarding this question by some measure, and China contributes about one third of the global income growth. So especially after the 2008-2009 global income crisis, you could say the Chinese economy has become the main driving force uh, of the global economy. And regarding whether this driving force can re energize uh, the global economy, uh, although it's highly unlikely that we are going to see anything that could match the golden age of 1960s or even the mini golden age, say from 2005 to 2007. Uh, but I would not be surprised if in the next few years, uh, the global economy would re-accelerate somewhat. Uh, but even with this re-acceleration, the various contradictions of the Chinese economy itself uh, will eventually impose limit on China's growth model. Right? So this is related to the uh, earlier question about given this growing working class demand and that will put pressure on China's capitalist profit. Uh, so this will be a major concern. And then the other concern has to do with China's growing dependence uh, on imports of energy resources. So China is already the world's largest oil importer, uh, coal importer, and will soon become the world's largest natural gas importer. Right. Now, the world oil market right now uh, has become relatively stable largely because of the U.S. shale oil boom. But in case the U.S. shale oil boom come to an end, and I will not be surprised, say, we are going to face some kind of oil price shock similar to the 2008 oil price shock in the next few years. So if that happens, and uh, that will uh, impose uh, serious tr trouble, uh, onto both the Chinese economy and the global economy. Mm -hmm. So what you are arguing for, arguing for is that the Chinese model is not sustainable in the future because of ecological concerns, right? But also for social reasons. Is yes. that right? Yes. Could you explain the internal contradictions a little bit more? Well, uh, with respect to the internal contradiction of the Chinese model, uh, 
And first, uh, as we have been talking about, uh, China's capitalist accumulation has transformed China's social structure. So it has produced the world's largest working class, uh, and uh, as well as a rapid, uh, rapidly expanding urban middle class. So both are now demanding higher living standard and uh, also more social rights, and also they have learned to organize, and therefore their struggle has become more effective. And as a result, the share that goes to capitalist profit in China's GDP or income output has been falling in recent years. And so this is a phenomenon that has not happened to other major economies in recent years, uh, certainly not in the neoliberal period. However, it's something similar to what happened to the Western capitalist economy in the 1960s. So that could be the uh, potential crisis that will threaten uh, China's uh, model of accumulation and then uh, in terms of the uh, environmental contradictions and uh, we have been talking about this uh, resistance of uh, environmental movement and we talk about China's uh, dependence on energy imports making China vulnerable uh, to uh, energy price shocks or geopolitical instabilities and then of course China still has an authoritarian regime so that does not contribute uh, to legitimacy of the Chinese capitalism, right? So all of these contradictions then potentially could converge, uh, say, within the next decade or so. Okay. But couldn't you imagine that the Chinese working class is successful in fighting for their rights, establishing a new social compromise with the Chinese ruling class? Uh, well, to have a new social compromise between the capitalists and the workers, it requires certain historic conditions, uh, like what happened to the Western working class after World War II, right? And that, of course, uh, happened on the one hand because of the struggle of the working class. Uh, but on the other hand, I have to say it has to do with the Western working class had a relatively privileged position in the capitalist world system. And therefore, they can benefit from unequal exchange against the rest of the world. So in other words, they can uh, export goods uh, that are produced with relatively smaller amount of labor in exchange for goods from the periphery uh, that embody lots of labor. Right. Uh, but this kind of condition, I think, is not going to be satisfied uh, in the Chinese case. And uh, first of all, it's because, uh, as we have been talking about, and uh, China still uh, does not have the capacity to compete against the West in the most highly value added commodities in the world market. And then secondly, there is simply not that much labor available in the periphery to engage in this kind of unequal exchange against China, uh, given the enormous size of population uh, of China. And then moreover, we also have the uh, ecological constraints, and therefore making this kind of proposed social compromise uh, highly unlikely. Thank you. So what do you expect for the future? In a 2015 publication, you uh, wrote, look to China if you want to locate the downfall of capitalism. Well, regarding the uh, downfall of capitalism, right? So this is actually not my invention. And uh, so for those who have read uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein, and in many of his works, and he has argued that the capitalist world system has entered into a structural crisis uh, that can no longer be resolved uh, within the uh, framework uh, of a capitalist world system. Uh, now, yeah, uh, Marx is probably uh, are famous for having uh, wrongly predicted uh, the downfall of capitalism. But simply because Marxists have made many mistakes does not mean capitalism as a historical system will not come to an end one day. Uh, now we know this capitalist world system is based on endless accumulation of capital. Right? Uh, for this endless accumulation of capital to happen, uh, it requires a constant supply of large cheap labor force. Uh, it requires constant uh, supply of a uh, massive amount uh, of cheap and abundant natural resources, uh, as well as environmental space. And it also requires certain uh, political conditions. And in the current historical context, 
uh, on the one hand, and with this uh, growing struggle of the Chinese working class, and uh, uh, also uh, with the uh, growing struggle uh, of the working class uh, in many other parts, parts of the world, including the historical core and the historical semi-peripheral part of the capitalist world system. Uh, we could enter into a situation that in the future it will be impossible for the existing system to design a global social compromise or global new deal that could accommodate not only the interests of Western working classes but also the interests of non-Western working classes. And then moreover, uh, after so many centuries of relentless capitalist accumulation, uh, the world now is threatened by the impending climate catastrophes as well as the possibility of collapse, collapse of other uh, ecological systems. And uh, it's very difficult to imagine that uh, given this system based on the capital accumulation, uh, yet can reconcile uh, the demand for accumulation with the requirements of uh, ecological sustainability. And in terms of uh, geopolitics, we currently live in a time when the U.S. hegemonic power is in decline, meaning that the U.S. Uh, is no longer in a position to lead the capitalist world system. It can no longer offer uh, the solutions uh, to various contradictions. Uh, and then moreover, I don't think either China or other big powers are in a position to replace the US to provide effective leadership uh, for the system and then to deal with uh, the various contradictions we have just talked about. So uh, given the combination of these reasons, and I would agree with Wallerstein's analysis that we are in the time of major structural crisis, and then uh, the outcome of this crisis, however, will depend on how the global class struggle will play out in the coming decades. Mm -hmm. And capitalism needs leadership, a global leader? You, you think it does? Well, any system needs some kind of regulation, needs some kind of management. And then in the case of the capitalist world system, we know historically it is one based on interstate competition. So in other words, we see many states instead of just one single state in the capitalist world system. Now this interstate competition on the one hand is required for capitalist ac accumulation. On the other hand, it creates problems for the system. And uh, so, for example, if we have conflicts between the states get out of control, right? Historically, it led to world wars, right? All these kind of conflicts could make the management of the global economy much more difficult. So historically, the system has required the existence of a relatively powerful state. Uh, that is more powerful than all the other states, right? And that could function as the hegemonic state. And so this hegemonic state would pursue not only its national interest, but also to some extent promote the interest of the system as a whole. Uh, so just like what the U.S. did after World War II, uh, so it provided not only not only New Deal at home, it also led the construction of new global social compromise. It had this Marshall Plan that uh, created effective demand for the recovery of the European economy and the Japanese economy, right? So the U.S. in that way also contribute, contributed to the, the growth of the entire system, right? Uh, but now the U.S. is no longer qualified for doing that. And for the reasons we have discussed, and China is not qualified to do that either. And then other big powers are even less likely uh, to accomplish this task. And so exactly at the moment that the capitalist world system is entering into structural crisis, it's also deprived of effective leadership. So that would be another major factor that would accelerate the current crisis. Thank you. So coming to an end, um, Wallerstein speaks of two possible trajectories. Um, in this phase of structural crisis. One is an authoritarian uh, way out of the crisis, and another one would be a more egalitarian, more democratic way. What do you expect? 
<laughs> well, honestly, that might be a question that even Wallerstein uh, himself uh, would not be able to answer. Uh, but uh, let me uh, put it this way. Uh, so with this growth uh, of the Chinese working class and with this incapacity uh, of the Chinese uh, capitalism to accommodate the, d the demand from the uh, Chinese uh, working class. And then uh, the also given the tradition of the Chinese revolution, uh, it's possible uh, for the impending crisis of Chinese capital capitalism to be resolved in such a way that some form of socialist revolution uh, is revived. And if such a social socialist revolution or working class revolution does take place in China, and then given China's central role in the global economy today, it will greatly increase the chance uh, that the uh, future crisis will be resolved in the more preferable, more egalitarian approach. Okay. Thank you very, very much for your answers. In the name of the VIDC and the Mattersburg Circle, I thank you for being with us. And if you look at the website of the VIDC, we had a wonderful panel discussion yesterday in Vienna, and there is a documentary for download. So thank you again for being here.